Football is a game of violence, a game fueled by collision, blood, guts, and relentless aggression. Or at least it was. Today's game is almost unrecognizable, with the offensive-minded NFL emphasizing player safety. Nearly all hits that would draw a reaction from the crowd are immediately flagged, leaving defensive players to sit idly by as offensive players continue to break records and light up the scoreboard. Today we will be going through the evolution of the hard hit, from its primal beginnings to the calculated lethality of the 1980s to the early 2000s, how rule changes and concerns for player safety led to the watered down form of hitting we have today. This is the rise and fall of hard hits. Are you a fan of big hits? Do you love old school hard nosed football? Do you hate how soft football has become? Well, here at Killshot, we embrace the natural violence and hard hitting nature of the game through our signature hard hitting apparel. At Killshot, you can find the type of American football shirts refs would flag for unnecessary roughness. Our football merch includes t shirts and hoodies with more items to come. It's the apparel real fans and athletes wear when they want to be feared. With football leagues attempting to eliminate all forms of big hits and physical play, football is now a pale imitation of what it once was. Take a stand and join the kill shot movement. Embrace the way football was meant to be played. Enter promo code BEASTMODE1 for a 20% discount off your first purchase. Thank you and enjoy the video. The 1950s, when the art of the big hit began to take the league by storm. The era of broken noses and teeth, face masks and clotheslines, when the only thing that wasn't legal fringed on the line of murder. This style of play was embodied by two particular players that set the gold standard of what it means to be a hard hitter. Hardy Brown, the man who is said to have knocked out 80 players in the course of his playing career with his infamous iron shoulder. A linebacker who weighed a mere 195 pounds was feared among all he faced. Brown even had a bounty put on his head by the Rams for $500. His reputation was such that officials frequently inspected his shoulder pads prior to games to ensure he was not hiding anything in them. Hardy Brown was the original headhunter, and his strategy was simple. As the opposing player approached, he crouched down ever so slightly and launched his shoulder into the opponent's chin, which had devastating results. The 1950s was an era of few rules, and no one took more advantage of this than Night Train Lane, creator of the Night Train necktie, in which he wrapped the opposing player's neck and yanked them down to the ground. He is considered by many to be one of the most feared hitters in NFL history. In 1955, Otto Graham, legendary QB for the Cleveland Browns, took a vicious forearm to the face as he fell out of bounds, causing him to get 15 stitches. This eventually led to the implementation of the face masks on helmets. The Night Train took full advantage of this innovation in player safety, aggressively yanking on the opponent's face mask to get him down, and was the main cause of outlawing the grabbing or pulling of an opponent's face mask in 1956. The 50s era also had the likes of Gino Marchetti, the league's first modern defensive end, who delivered punishing blows. Bill George, middle linebacker for the Chicago Bears, the first modern linebacker. Doug Atkins, one of the biggest and most powerful men in the league, who tormented and punished QBs throughout his 17-year career. And Chuck Bednarik, who is remembered for his knockout hit on Frank Gifford in his punishing style of play. The 50s was a time of unregulated violence, a game of hunters and prey. The 1960s for the NFL was a year of exponential growth and increasing competition, creating ever more vicious and hard-nosed headhunters. Jones was a 14th round draft pick, with little being expected from him. But the Secretary of Defense was determined to prove the naysayers wrong, and would go on to torment QBs for 14 seasons. With his patented head slap, which he learned from watching Muhammad Ali box, he disoriented his opponents and got into the backfield as quickly as the QB said hike, 
and delivered punishing hits. Jones' head slap technique was so effective that in 1977 it was banned, claiming that the controversial move was too brutal for the NFL. Deacon Jones would go on to be considered one of the greatest defensive linemen in NFL history and one of its most relentless and ferocious tacklers. The closest thing to a monster to ever step on the football field, Buckus is considered by many to be one of, if not the hardest hitter in NFL history, and for good reason. Gale Sayers, Hall of Fame running back for the Chicago Bears, put it this way, He didn't hit you low, he hit you in the chest. He put his soul into tackling you. Buckus played with rage that translated into a destructive force of nature on the football field. His goal was to knock somebody's head off. Before hiking the ball, QBs often said they could hear Buckus growling like a wild animal, which sent shivers down players' spines. He was more beast than man, frequently biting opposing players' fingers and doing everything in his power to separate the man from the ball, and to great effect. Two honorable mentions for the 1960s are Bill Saul, the first player in NFL history to be mic'd up, and was the first in the long line of hard-nosed Steelers middle linebackers who would dominate the 1970s. Ray Nitschke, middle linebacker for the Green Bay Packers, known for his tremendous strength and toughness, even after nearly being killed after a 5,000-pound steel structure fell on top of him during practice. He shrugged it off and continued with the day's practice. The 1960s was an era of brutality and grit that set the stage for the incoming hard hitters of the 1970s. In the 1970s, players became bigger, faster, stronger. With lighter gear, hits became even more vicious. Jack Lambert, a man that may have been even more intimidating than Dick Buckus. Lambert stood at 6 feet 4 inches tall, weighing a mere 210 pounds. But what he lacked in weight, he made up for an intimidation and ruthless aggression. A nine-time Pro Bowler and the middle linebacker for the Pittsburgh Steelers during their four Super Bowl wins, Lambert is considered by many to be the personification of the Steel Curtain. Described as Count Dracula and cleats, he struck fear into opposing quarterbacks and ravaged the NFL for 11 years. Jack Tatum, the Assassin Being a free safety, Tatum built up tremendous speed before colliding with an opposing player, and Tatum did not hold back. Tatum was the most brutal hitter of the 1970s, with nearly all hits intended to inflict maximum damage. Tatum said his goal was to make the receiver think twice about catching the ball, and he achieved it two times over. Tatum is more infamously known for his hit on New England Patriots receiver, Daryl Stingley, that paralyzed Stingley from the waist down. But again, that was the nature of the game. Tatum was also one of few men to stand up to the wrecking ball, Earl Campbell. On the fourth and one, Tatum delivered a big hit, whipping Earl's head back and knocking him off balance. That hit would knock both Tatum and Campbell out for the rest of the game. However, Tatum's crowning hit was on Sammy White in Super Bowl XI, knocking his helmet right off. Tatum was a linebacker with cornerback speed, and it made him one of the most intimidating and hardest hitting players in the NFL. The 70s also included the likes of Mel Blunt, the most physical corner in NFL history. He bullied and overpowered receivers, and eventually led to the Mel Blunt rule where defensive backs can only make contact with receivers within 5 yards of the line of scrimmage. When receivers did manage to catch a ball, Mel Blunt was sure to punish them. Just ask Cliff Branch. The 1970s Steel Curtain was a force to be reckoned with. Mean Joe Green was one of the most violent and prolific defensive linemen in NFL history. Jack Ham, who many consider to be one of, if not the greatest outside linebacker in NFL history, played perfectly off Jack Lambert, a textbook tackler that delivered punishing hits and was the glue to the steel curtain. We also can't forget about Jack Tatum's fellow hitman, George Atkinson, 
a man known for clubbing and clotheslining. His hits were nasty and borderline malicious. Atkinson and Tatum's vicious style of play was the start of the Raiders' infamous reputation as a dirty team. The style of play was not sitting well with the NFL and enacted some rules to create a bigger sense of player safety. In 1976, a defender is not permitted to run or dive into a ball carrier who has fallen to the ground untouched. In 1979, they enacted a rule stating a player may be penalized for unsportsmanlike conduct for non-contact acts such as throwing a punch or forearm or kicking an opponent. Classified under personal foul, they also enacted in the same year. It is unnecessary roughness if a tackler uses his helmet to spear or ram an opponent. The rules were steadily starting to change as players became bigger and faster, and as collisions became more intense, the NFL started to outlaw certain tackles and defensive tactics. In the 1980s, consumer culture dominated the US, and the demand for tougher play and harder hits were at an all-time high. A young man named Lawrence Taylor answered the call. Fueled by an unrelenting will and his ferocious style of play, Taylor terrorized the league with the perfect combination of speed and power that spelled a nightmare for offenses. Intimidation was one of LT's favorite tactics. Hey, Charlie, you hope I never get back in now and kick your with many opposing players defeated before even stepping on the field with LT. Taylor is also known more infamously for his hit on Joe Theismann, which resulted in a compound fracture in Theismann's right leg, ending his career. Although the hit was not malicious, it did add to an already mean and nasty reputation Taylor developed throughout his career. There is no question that the 85 Bears are one of the greatest defenses in NFL history, and that could not have been possible without Mike Singletary, the heart of the defense. Many QBs recall when looking at Singletary prior to the snap, were struck by the intensity in his eyes, almost like a shark, instinctually wired to kill and feast on the weak. The Destroyer Lot knew football was a game of violence, and he intended to inflict as much of it as possible. Lot was willing to sacrifice his body to ensure his dominance on the field. Seemingly lacking all form of self-preservation, he launched himself through his opponents, leaving them wishing they hadn't stepped on the field. Known for his decision to amputate one of his fingers rather than to miss some playing time off the field, and his infamous hit on Icky Woods, which shifted the momentum to the 49ers in Super Bowl XXIII. Lott was the embodiment of the hard-hitting mentality and shaped the way safeties would play the game in the incoming generations. The hard-hitting era of the 1980s did face some rule changes. In 1982, they enacted a rule stating, it is illegal for any player to use the crown or top of his helmet against a passer, a receiver in the act of catching a pass, or a runner who is in the grasp of a tackler. In 1985, they restricted defenders from hitting players that slid to the ground feet first. In 1989, they stated that a defender approaching from any direction who has an unrestricted path to the quarterback is prohibited from flagrantly hitting him in the area of the knees. The NFL's growing concern with player safety led to more and more rule changes. The 90s kicked off with a boom as the young hard-hitting safety for the Denver Broncos, Steve Atwater, faced off against the Kansas City Chiefs led by their hulking running back Christian Okoye, the Nigerian Nightbear. Okoye, seemingly untackable, met face to face with Atwater, which resulted in a thunderous hit, sending Okoye flat on his back. Elway stated, we could hear that hit from the sideline. Atwater, the smiling assassin, hit with reckless abandon. Any receiver who dared to catch a ball in the middle of the field would be punished severely. One of Atwater's more iconic hits occurred in Super Bowl 32. In Green Bay's final drive, Favre launched the ball deep to Robert Brooks, when Atwater flew in and delivered a brutal hit, knocking out Brooks, himself, and his fellow teammate, Randy Hillard. However, another player that would be one of the 90s hardest hitters lined up just along him, Dennis Smith, a man that no doubt heavily influenced right Atwater's style of play and considered Atwater to be his protege. 
Smith's timing was impeccable and molded one of the hardest hitters in history. Junior Seau, run and hit, run and hit. The mantra of one of the most violent and ruthless hitters of the 1990s, Junior Seau, relentless and filled with passion. He played every play like it was his last. The Tasmanian Devil made it his goal to inflict as much pain on opposing players as possible, especially QBs. A 12-time Pro Bowler who led the Chargers to an appearance at Super Bowl 29. Although the end of his life was certainly tragic, he inspired generations of football players and it was a pleasure to watch him play. Run, hit, run and hit. Run, hit, run, hit. Bill Romanowski. Two words describe Romanowski's career. Brutal down at the 40 yard. and controversial. Romanowski was ruthless, unforgiving and playing up nasty on and off the field, delivering cheap shots, dislocating elbows, breaking jaws, breaking yes, fingers. But just whatever it was, just, I just snapped it. The list goes on and on. Although Romanowski's career is marred in controversy, there's no question that Romanowski was a hard hitter, the human embodiment of an enraged bull with no regard for human life. Standing 6 feet 4 inches and weighing 265 pounds, Bruce Smith was a force to be reckoned with and punished the QB more than any other player in NFL history. Amassing 200 sacks throughout his NFL career, Smith was also quick and nimble, frequently utilizing his signature spin move to get to the quarterback. And when he did, the results were devastating. An athletic freak in every sense of the word, he was big, fast, and powerful, which resulted in big hits. The 1990s also saw its fair share of rule changes that affected big hits. In 1990, they ruled, a player who butts, spears, or rams an opponent may be disqualified if the action is flagrant or vicious. Defensive players are prohibited from forcibly hitting the defenseless player's head, neck, or face with the helmet or face mask. When tackling a passer during or just after throwing a pass, a defensive player is prohibited from unnecessarily and violently throwing him down and landing on top of him with all or most of the defender's weight. The NFL was slowly starting to strip away a defensive player's ability to make a big hit. But the 2000s era would see accumulation of talent, athletic ability, and big hits. An era termed the headhunting era. The, the game is completely different. But they're still. I, play, I played in a headhunting era. I talked it, I walked it, and I backed it all up. There is no better player to kick off the 2000s than Ray Lewis, the leader and muscle of the 2000 Ravens a defense that ranks among the greatest of all time. Ray Lewis was vicious, a modern Dick Buckus, with even more speed and power. Combined with his big hit ability, Lewis was also a prolific leader and motivator. However, nothing would motivate his defense more than the cracking of helmets from a big hit. John Lynch was a warrior, fearless and violent. His goal was to rip somebody's head off. He believed in equality, delivering hits on unknowns and on NFL royalty. Lynch, hit him so hard. Lynch quickly developed a reputation for his hard-hitting ability and struck fear into pass catchers and ball carriers alike. A man many believed to be too slow coming out of college became one of the hardest-hitting safeties of our generation. Dawkins was like something created by an evil scientist with the goal of creating someone with maximized aggression and no remorse. His nickname, Weapon X, which derives from Marvel Comics, draws similarities between Dawkins and Rage style of play and Wolverine's Berserker Rage. Dawkins played with the chip on his shoulder, many believing he was undersized. Weighing only 209 pounds, this drove Dawkins to play harder and faster than anyone on the field determined to prove the world wrong. In the headhunting era, we also begin to see the implementation of heavy fines and suspensions. 
Harrison is without a doubt one of the hardest hitters of our generation. But unfortunately for Rodney, the NFL was starting to inflict more punishment regarding big hits and the protection of player safety. Harrison was a linebacker at defensive back and his goal was to punish any offensive player who dared cross his path. Unfortunately, with these new rules being enforced and Harrison's headhunter mentality, many considered him to be a dirty player. Throughout the course of his career, he had 18 unnecessary roughness penalties, 7 personal fouls, 4 roughing the passer penalties, with a total of 77 penalties, and was voted 3 times the dirtiest player in the NFL. Harrison was feared by all and made pass catchers think twice. One of his more infamous hits was on Hall of Famer Jerry Rice, when Rodney delivered a helmet-to-helmet -helmet hit that cost him $120,000. When asked how he felt about the hit, Harrison stated, Jerry Rice did that slant and I got a chance to hit him, he added. I would have spent half a million bucks on that to get the chance to knock his freaking head off. I love Jerry Rice, but when it came down to that game, I was not afraid of Jerry, and I wanted him to know my name. The 2000s was a time when bone-crushing hits were celebrated, as seen with Jacked Up, a segment during halftime on Monday Night Football. The show focused in on violent collisions and counted down the top five hits of that week. This was a show beloved by fans as we saw the world's greatest athletes at maximum speed ram into each other. It was awesome. However, the era of the celebration and advocation of NFL violence would come crashing down. If you put on a helmet, go out to a field and play football on a Saturday and suffer a violent blow to your head, you've suffered great damage. Webster died today. A heart attack took his life at the age of 50. Mr. Seau, unconscious, suffering from a gunshot wound to the chest. 